Well, hello again. Right, I have taken your advice. Seriously, so many of you just said, do coils in your comments. Uh, yeah, you were right. Uh, we did coils. Now, we did it for the story. I'm going to do synced min item level later. We're currently moving our uh, right now suspended WoW Raid Knights over to FF after Endwalker. But man, it was a fascinating experience. I've also done Crystal Tower, of course, for MSQ. So there's a bit to talk about there. And this whole thing was just so interesting. It's a sort of raid experience that is very different to what I've experienced in MMO raids. So, Coils and Crystal Tower, let's go. And also, hello, this is a new channel. If you would like to stick around for the rest of my FF14 journey, uh, helpful videos like the G-Shade one we just published, and what's going to follow afterwards across even more RPGs and MMOs and stuff, then uh, slam that sub button, ring the bell, and let's go. So, Coils of Bahamut, unsurprisingly, resolves the story of Bahamut and the Battle of Cartano, And it does so in a way that I just love, especially as somebody who's used to how World of Warcraft does these things. Now, this is the non-spoiler version, right? So, non-spoiler, obviously they set up the Battle of Cartano quite well. Then, via Alphano's A Realm Reborn story, and, uh, well, just you know, the core story of, of, of A Realm Reborn, you come to learn and understand many of the rules that govern the world, right? All of this grows on you slowly so that you actually understand it because, well, the Scions deal with what the Scions deal with and you're one of them, therefore you get it, right? And of course, it's all explained in the game through your character's journey. I know FF people, you might say, uh, of course, that's what games do. <laughs> yeah, not in all of them. So once Coils hits, we meet up with Alizé and uh, all the big pieces are, are in place. Big things happen, and what is core? Uh, this, is, this is what great. What's core? Is it rather than playing all of this as a big moment to tease future content via, you know, a quick inversion of the story that's super fast and mysterious, they do the complete opposite, right? They actually tell their story. They do so in a way to pay off the character's arcs and just bring the whole thing to a satisfying conclusion. I'm sure there could be a few speculations, but really there is no, hmm, what's next, to any of this. There's no speculation video to do, breaking down what happened and it, no. It's just a really satisfying end of a story. And that is such a breath of fresh air to what I'm used to. Uh, from what I can tell, the whole what's next bit of FF14 storytelling far more hinges on what will naturally happen because of the state of the world and its peoples rather than dropping mystery boxes around the place. You know, recently I finished the Sanctum of Domination raid in World of Warcraft and it's just so different. Like that raid, so little plot happens during the raid. Like really so little. And the ending, which was this super short cinematic, was all just plays, played to tease mystery and incite speculation. It like wasn't interesting at a character level. It wasn't satisfying. They didn't put any of the work in, you know, by World of Warcraft Sylvanas, February, 2022. And Cause of Bahamut is just in complete stark contrast. Now there is merit to what WoW does for a WoW raid. Um, because it can be exciting when it does it well, like you are wondering, oh, what is, you know, what's the cool mystery to decipher? But I mean, man, sometimes it just needs to pull back and focus on telling a satisfying narrative experience like now, rather than just sacrificing all of that for the big mystery tease. So spoiler free, that is my, my thought on like how the story is. I'll return to stories in a spoilerific way for the final section of this video. Till then, more thoughts. What I really noticed is, between Coils and Crystal Tower, I just started to appreciate how raids seem to be handled in this game. Uh, to put it simply, they tell the full story either in the raid or in its questline. And the questline will actually take place between wings of the raid. So, you know, rather than getting a pat in the back and a good luck from an NPC and then just having to go face off all the bosses with not a lot of story going on in between, you do get a far more cohesive narrative experience. Um, Crystal Tower had a lot of that. Its full storyline unfolded across its three wings and, you know, all the quests that were before and between them. Very different versus, say, the, the game I'm used to for raids and stories, which is WoW. Um, they're a lot more willing in FF to put the story in the raid. 
And surprisingly enough, that does make the story work far better. It very much elevates the content because you kind of feel in your first time pretty pumped. Now, of course, the important bit is the players can skip all those cutscenes and blast through the content if they so choose, right? So it's just that thing where within the raid, like I know WoW has got story in its raids, but not as much as FF really has story there. And when there's that story to enjoy, it's great. And they're clearly not ashamed of telling you a story. You know, like you get a 15 minute uh, cutscene, you know, when uh, Flames of Truth is shown in Coils. And like that just makes it all come together so uh, just so much more than the sum of its parts, right? I mean, you see that big cinematic before the, the final, you know, the, the end fight. And it, it's just so cool. You feel really pumped. And that just delivers this very complete feeling narrative experience, not just a, a string of boss fights. All, of course, with that stuff being skippable so that you can have snappy repeat runs. Really fantastic. Uh, music. I know I need to talk about music more. Um, man, the music's so much more out there than I'm used to. Like, Garuda's has got the vocals. Uh, indeed, like quite a few of the trials and the raids, uh, they've got vocals. And I mean, man, the, the final Bahamut fight where it's playing answers, like that's pretty incredible. The phase transitions that feel just like perfectly timed. It just comes together so well. It elevates the experience. Um, and just the way that that track and the different versions of it kind of permeate through the, the Coils soundtrack, it's, it's near perfect. And again, for me, it's a very welcome change in pace from the sort of generic looming orchestral stuff that I've been used to. So again, yes, there's a bit of a novelty bias here, but it's another massive experiential thumbs up. Where's the trash? Right? Very little raid content seems to have trash. And I mean, there's a little bit of trash in what I've seen, but not that much. And then people tell me that there's basically no trash in uh, Stormblood and beyond. I mean, I think back to WoW and I remember Trial of the Crusader and thinking it was really neat because it was a boss rush. I've never really enjoyed trash. It's almost like it's called trash as a reason. And I always kind of was suspicious of the argument that trash helps to pace the experience, but I just kind of went along with it. But now that I'm here, I'm like, you know what? Would I rather have big, cool cutscenes and boss fights and the ability to skip the cutscenes to do more boss fights if I want to? Yeah, I actually really would. And I think to my Sanctum of Domination raid nights, and it's like, too much of that is spent running and fighting trash. And the trash is never fun. It never adds to the experience. So, what is the role of trash? Is there a way we can kind of escape it somehow? I have to wonder. Then another funky thing. Once unlocked, it seems like you can just queue for the bit that you want. That's very different. Um, you know, it's not like just queuing for an LFR wing because this includes seemingly doing like the proper full dungeon difficulty with a group. You can just go select the bit you want to do. Uh, now, WoW does have, of course, skips once you do multiple clears of a raid, and that is nice, but uh, this just feels quite open and approachable, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty big for that, actually. Um, it's kind of how I, I really like the old one-off bosses that WoW had, like, you know, Sartharian and stuff. Um, so with this, just the ability to be like, I want to do a boss, boom, do a boss. It's like, it's really flexible. Um, and if you don't like something, you don't have to do it. So, man, I think there's something to be learned there as well. Scale then. Now, other MMOs have got this quite a bit as, as well in their various raids, but man, the sheer scale of coils is mind blowing. And that just makes for such a compelling experience. I mean, especially towards the end and you know, the bit with all of the jumping where you just get the, this colossal sense of scale. So that's really, really cool. And even in Crystal Tower, like when you go, um, you know, the very end of Crystal Tower, like where you go for that boss, again, really, really, really cool. So they have they have totally been able to hit me with a spectacle and just really have that work. So that's been neat. The next, uh, this is not really about the content itself. It's more just something that I really came to appreciate. Um, so Coils of Bahamut exists to wrap up the Battle of Cartano and really, I think, tie a neat bow on Final Fantasy XIV Legacy. And just, I, I guess something I really appreciated with it is 
just the amount of effort they went to. Like, yeah, not only did they, you know, build a custom engine uh, that's an offshoot of Luminous, I think, or, you know, borrows from it. Not only did they do that and remake the whole game, but, like, they worked the whole narrative into it. They do the big Battle of Cartano, and then there's the, the, the bit after, the Flames of Truth bit, and then they hold that back and only give it to you, like, way later when you're actually able, through the whole narrative experience, to understand it. Um, it's just so much, like effort into truly and like satisfyingly paying off a massive thing that has happened in the game world. And I just really appreciated that. You know, you just, you always get this sense throughout ARR that like the, the whole calamity has just that it shaped the world and everything that's went on so much. So by the time you actually reach coils, I guess it's just that thing. They, they take their time with it. And by the time you actually get there, it just all comes together, and uh, it was just a really cool experience. I understand why it is not enforced to do it for MSQ, but man, yeah, you are all right. You really should do this. You really should do Goals of Bahamut if you can. Definitely, I want to do it synced minimum item level once we're a little bit more organized in-game. Absolutely. I suppose on the gameplay side, I don't have a great deal to say here because we did coils unsynced for the sake of speed. Um, just in our FC, like a bunch of us were busy. People told me that like the reason why everyone was putting that in the video comments was really for the narrative experience of it all. Um, but what we did do, uh, especially in fights like Bahamut, is all of the higher level people just auto attacked the boss. So we at least got a bit of a natural progression through. I know that is not an ideal thing. Um, and I do plan like the proper dive into this. Um, I cannot wait to do Bahamut properly because that fight seemed pretty incredible. Um, just the spectacle, the music, Bahamut himself looks so cool. And you know, I've, I've done this, but now I'm really excited to do it again, like synced minimum item level. And it just made me think, you know, so many people in my free company were like, oh, cool, we're going to show you this. It's going to be really cool. And then, you know, I go do it. It's really cool. Now, one of my favorite raids in World of Warcraft is Throne of Thunder. I think it's, it's just such a great raid. Lei Shen is such a great final boss. It's super, super fun. And it was just like, imagine if I could say, hey, everyone, we're going to do Throne of Thunder synced minimum item level. And then we could go back there and actually do Throne of Thunder, vaguely similarly to how it actually felt back in the day when I first did it. Because the systems of the game would actually support that kind of thing and make that old content at least have the potential to provide relevant gameplay. And WoW just doesn't support that in general. And when it does, it's a part of the fleeting time walking system, which really needs more development. And it just really opened my mind to like, wow, I, I, we're going to go and do this old raid that we all out level, but you know, we're going to do it in a way where it's hard and challenging. Uh, and the game supports that. Again, this is not something I'm used to. And just, I think of the possibilities. It's really cool, and I really hope Blizzard are able to get something in 10.0 to World of Warcraft that achieves similar. I really do. Quick note on poetics then. So from what I understand, if you just kept on farming uh, coils, like you wouldn't get poetics. But in this case, because I believe I hadn't done it before, everyone with me got like 100 poetics for, um, you know, for each, um, for each turn that we did. And I just thought that was a really neat little system, a great little incentive to, well, just to get people to like help a new player. I thought that was really nice. And in general, the whole system with Poetics, like because there is still a fair amount of instanced content that I have to do while I level, getting Poetics for that is like really satisfying because I, I can feel myself, you know, I mean, I have the Ironworks gear now on my Ninja, but once I hit 60, I know that there'll be the Heaven Sword sort of whatever big sets that I can buy with poetics. I just think that's a really cool thing. And if I help my friends and get more poetics in the future, well, I know that like, i am not only will I be getting glam for alt jobs, I'll also be getting gear that'll be really useful for those alt jobs when I level them up. So I just think the poetics, it, it's a very simple, simple system, but I really like how it just keeps more aspects of the game rewarding in a way that feels relevant enough to uh, to your character, like no matter what. So uh, yeah, I think that's great. 
Okay, Coil's narrative then. So, I I just really like that. So, number one, Alphano and Alizé actually getting to see a little bit more of the, like, the two of them, like, especially the duo towards the end. Just really, really good to see. Um, and I think good that you see that before you go into Heavensward, because I think it just reinforces some of Alphano's, like, character and, and attitude, which obviously is something that over Heavensward changes, as, you know, he no longer acts like a Redditor, according to Yoshi P. Another thing I like, then, is with Louis Soir and how they specifically dealt with uh, him becoming a primal. Because if they had have just played that, you know, you could have been very confused. But the way that they do the primal reveal is, you know, it's only after the player has been very much equipped with knowledge. So that, much like Alphano, you, the player, can actually, you know, piece the puzzle pieces, like you can piece them together yourself. But even if you don't, well, Alphano's explanation is like satisfying and it makes sense within the game world. And it's just that thing where like, it's surprising the scope of what Louis Wa achieves, but then it's not surprising logically. So it totally fits within the world, but then it's super impressive. Super impressive, you know, fr from your perspective as a player who is immersed in the world as your character, where your character really is a character in the world. And that's just really effective. And then, of course, because, you know, Louis Wiles are primal now, um, you know, we, we all know he could be summoned in again. Uh, but we know the cost that would have in the world. So, but but we still know that people would want to because it, it's all, you know, people's hopes and prayers. But that would go against what he would want. So it's, that's just really quite nicely set up because, you know, we see these primals initially with all the beast tribes and like we, we sort of understand that, but it's still in a decently othering way. And then between uh, Louis Soi and um, Lady Iceheart and Shiva, you, I think you just get a more complete understanding of how that thing works. And it, it makes it feel like both rich and characterful, but also quite logically sensible. And it's just that thing where the visuals here, they do risk extreme cheese, don't they? But they really earn those visuals, and that really is the key, because they only try to sell you that he has done this crazy, incredible thing after they've done such a good job of laying the narrative foundations for it to work. And that's the thing. The writing really felt like it was in sync with the player's experience. It wasn't those one of those things where you felt like the writers, you know, you see a scene, and you just feel like the writers know more than you do. And, I mean, obviously that's going to be the truth all the time, but sometimes that can happen in an unsatisfying way where it feels like you don't have all of the puzzle pieces needed to fully appreciate uh, the story. And, I mean, yeah, you know, it wasn't that sort of strange feeling you get in World of Warcraft where you feel like the people that are writing the story aren't telling us everything we need to know to properly appreciate the story in the here and now. I'm okay, oh, like, I'm okay for getting new information that makes you retroactively appreciate a story that you've seen. I mean, in a way, this stuff with Louis Soir and Bahamut, that does happen. You retroactively uh, do appreciate the initial ba uh, Battle of Cartano stuff more after you learn these things. But it's not in a way that sacrifices how you appreciated the first cinematic in the beginning. And it doesn't cheapen it either. I mean, I think about, you know, just because it's two characters who get some sort of godlike energy and go whoosh into the sky, but, you know, there's Louis Soir going whoosh, and then there's Tyrande going whoosh, you know, all hyped up in the Elune Night Warrior powers. So it's, you know, both these characters getting these kind of, like, godlike powers. And with Louis Soir, it's, it's really cool and satisfying, because all of that time explaining the primal lore in different contexts that you, the player, can logically apply to the context you're currently in, as Alphano does. Whereas with Taronda and Aloon, it's like we barely really understand what Aloon is in this world. We barely understand the overall system that Aloon and all of these things um, actually sort of play into. We don't really understand their operational bounds. We don't perfectly understand Teldrassil as it pertains to all of these characters and their powers. Um, the writing is very fast and vague. So like, I'm fairly sure I knew what, what went on, but it was ambiguous enough, uh, ambiguous enough that a lot of people didn't perfectly get it or maybe got a little bit misled um, by their initial impression because Blizzard didn't tell their story that clearly. And there wasn't a satisfying conclusion for Tyrande either, I, I think. I think most people would agree. It was a pretty ropey situation. And, you know, if, if Blizzard had of 
went so much slower in this story and actually given it the runtime, it could have worked. But they didn't give it the runtime. They took it too fast. And like, I mean, a minute and a half, two minutes cinematic in, in FF14 is like normal. You get them all the time. With Blizz, a lot less so. And you can just see that, well, look, you reap what you sow. And Blizzard keeps on trying to reap an incredible harvest, but it hasn't sown the seeds and watered them and nourished them and I don't know all the things you do to seeds to make them go big. They haven't done those things. Whereas in FF, it's like, maybe they purposefully choose not to be overly ambitious and to work within their means and to just have a more workmanlike approach to laying down their narrative framework. And it just means that whenever they try to pull off their big moments, at least in this case, and certainly for the end of ARR as well, it's just a lot more satisfying. And I think there are serious narrative lessons to be learned um, just with the overall macro narrative construction of, uh, of this game. And I think Coils of Bahamut is a really good example of that. So there you go. You all told me to do Coils of Bahamut, and uh, I know some of you will be unsatisfied that I didn't do it, uh, you know, synced min item level. Uh, I hope you understand why and that I am going to do that in the future, but uh, I do think most people were saying that because they were like, hey, don't miss this bit of the story before you move on to Heavensward. So yeah, I took that seriously. And uh, man, I think a few things have been learned indeed. Very interesting. Thank you for, uh, I suppose, the suggestions, the recommendations. They certainly spurred me on to do it. I'm very glad that I did. So there you go. That's uh, my experience of that. Um, have a wonderful day. Keep on giving me suggestions. I mean, damn, you guys have got a pretty high hit rate. Um, sub to the channel, of course, for more FF content, as well as eventually other MMORPG content. And with that, I will see you next time.